Well, welcome to this uh, webinar um, on a Wednesday afternoon here um, and obviously a Wednesday morning uh, in Washington. I'm very, very pleased um, to be introducing um, the subject today, the Code of Capital, how the law creates wealth and inequality. Um, my job on these occasions is very much to uh, make the introductions and get out of the way so we can hear from our speaker, uh, Professor Katharina Pista, um, and uh, you, you may well know me, uh, Mike Wardle, Director and Head of Indices for the ZN Group. Um, and really it's for me to, first of all, thank uh, our sponsors. Uh, the FS Club is uh, free to range widely across the fields of technology, innovation um, and finance. The reason we can do so is through the generosity of our sponsors who uh, support us and allow us to uh, put on these programmes of events which range far and wide. Um, so thank you very much to them. Our programme today uh, is very simple. Um, as I say, I'll be getting out of the way very shortly. We have a keynote uh, presentation um, and some time after the presentation for questions and answers. Uh, for those of you who haven't used the GoToWebinar system before, uh, you'll find a, a question panel um, on the dashboard that you can see on your screen. Uh, you just need to open that and type in the question that you want us uh, to pose uh, at the end of the session. Um, and please put your questions in at any point during the webinar. Um, you don't need to hang on until we get to the question answer session. Um, and then I'll moderate those um, as we run through the discussion uh, at the end. Um, anyone who does ask a question, we will be passing on contact details uh, and your question um, to Katharina um, after the event. Um, so if there's any follow up or any uh, further communication that's needed to fully answer a question, um, we'll be able to put you in touch. Um, so without further ado, um, Katarina, I'm very, very pleased to welcome you uh, to the FS Club web webinar series. Really looking forward to your presentation um, and it's over to you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Um, and uh, my job here is to say a little bit about my core argument in the Code of Capital, how the law creates wealth and inequality, which was published by Princeton two years ago now. Um, uh, next. So my core thesis in this book is that capital is coded in law. There has, of course, been a long debate about what capital is. Um, most economists think of it as one of the two factors of production. There's capital and there's labor. Many people associate it with some, some things that you can you know, put into the production process, such as machinery, but also money. Um, I take a slightly different view. Um, uh, I'm basically saying uh, capital is a wealth generating asset and in order to flip an ordinary asset into an asset that can generate wealth and also protect wealth that has been generated, you need law because in the end you need the backing of the um, by the means of coercion to make that stick. Next. So the core attributes of capital, of a capital asset, a simple asset that has been coded as capital, the core attributes that law can graft onto different assets in order to flip them into wealth generating assets are priority, durability, universality, and convertibility. Priority basically ranks interest or rights to things or interest or, um, or claims in, uh, in, in, in a hierarchical fashion. So some people have better rights and others have weaker rights. And if you have a better right and there's a dispute, then you win. The best case to always think about who has the best rights is uh, the case of insolvency. By definition, an insolvent debtor has fewer assets than their claims against that debtor. And the creditors then have to basically line up and will uh, figure out who has better rights. They can enforce their full claim before anybody else gets anything. And those at the back of the line will only get the leftovers, pretty much um, nothing um, at the very end of that, of that line. Durability means that I can protect the value of assets or can create um, an, an environment in which assets or the value of the assets can incubate over time. So I can extend um, my, my interest in these assets over time. And we use typically um, uh, corporate law um, or the trust, the common law trust, to protect assets from too many different creditors so that they can grow and will not be taken apart. The third attribute is universality, uh, which means that I extend the, the rights that have been created in relationship to these different assets in space. Uh, universality means that certain interests that have been created are are um, valid not only vis-a-vis -vis 
other contracting parties, other parties with whom I have negotiated these rights, but they are valid against the world and they're valid against the world only because I can recruit courts and bailiffs and the coercive um, power of the state to protect these rights against anybody who might trespass on it. And last but not least, in our world of financial capitalism, convertibility is really the way in which financial assets attain durability. You can lock in past gains by being able to convert your risky assets into less risky assets or maybe into cash in times of crisis. And we see the run for an accident in financial crisis always because people are trying to convert their private assets into cash. Why? Because only state-issued money can retain its nominal value, not always its real value. We know that too, but it's nominal value and that's worth a lot in times of crisis. So you really need three out of these four attributes to code anything in as, as capital. So I'm basically saying in a, you know, in a nutshell, give me any object, any promise or any idea and I can flip them into a capital asset by grafting three out of four of these capital attributes onto these assets. Next. So what are the legal tools that we use to do so? In the book, I call them the modules. You can also think of them as elements. So when I talk about coding, I'm not talking about codifications in the continental European sense. I'm talking about the process of coding capital by using different modules, um, different uh, tools in the legal toolkit to create priority rights, to create durability, to create universality, to create convertibility. And that's what lawyers do. So property law um, uh, basically not only excludes, that's the sign that is up here, but as I mentioned before, it also ranks. Uh, you get better rights um, over others. So does collateral law. If you have a secured interest and the data defaults, then you can enforce against those assets. The unsecured creditors get the less leftovers. Trust law, the common law trust, this is also a funny image. I, I use sort of the design features in PowerPoints and I came up, came up with this, but the common law trust is of course not only about trusting people, but it's also about protecting assets from others. And that's uh, what uh, folks have done since the 16th century at least, um, and with the use even earlier in, in England um, uh, to protect their assets uh, from different claimants, including from the state and the tax claims against it. Um, corporate law is another um, very powerful legal module. It also separates assets from different claimants. So a shareholder has a claim against the company, against its future profits to get some dividends or, and the shareholder can sell the share and might vote uh, at upcoming um, um, shareholder meetings. But the shareholder, not even the shareholder, can get at the assets of the corporation because we have created a legal entity that owns its own assets, uh, contracts in its own name, is, can be sued and sues itself in its own name. So that's a, a legal construct without which we couldn't have these incubator of wealth that live forever unless they go bankrupt, right? They have an infinite lifespan um, as compared to us mortals. Um, bankruptcy law is kind of um, in between private law modules and, and public law. It's mandatory law, um, uh, but it also creates its own priority rules. Um, there are rules in bankruptcy and insolvency law that say um, who has better rights and who has lesser rights. And if we do something like create bankruptcy safe harbors, we are effectively creating new types of priority rules through bankruptcy law. And then last but not least, there's contract law, the most, um, uh, uh, maybe the most uh, bilateral, uh, co you know, contractual type of device, but it does, it can be used to recreate some of the features of these other uh, legal modules. And especially with information technology today, we can recreate almost universality through contracts. If I can contract with a billion different customers, with the same contract that I dictate, then effectively I have set the rules of the game for this particular contract with billions um, of people. So we can do a lot with contract, much more than maybe the early theorists uh, would have thought. Next. So what I do in the book, basically, I, I show how different types of, I call them all assets. So I land as an object, a firm, and business organization, if you want debt, it's, it's a promise to return some money maybe with interest um, in the future, know-how, its ideas, its skills. These different things, assets, 
have been coded in capital and I have a chapter on, on each uh, how this has been done. So I don't have enough time today to walk you through it, but just to say a few words about this. For land, of course, I go through the enclosure movement in England, but I also draw parallels to what happened in the, in the New World, um, uh, what kind of claims the settlers made when they came to North America, Australia, New Zealand. I have some references to India as well. For firms, I take apart uh, the Lehman um, uh, Brothers bankruptcy to show how the corporate form has been used not only to make possible production investment, that's sort of how we think about the corporate form most of the time, but when you have an entity that has at least 200 different subsidiaries and they're used to raise their own debt um, um, on the markets but then are having certain arrangements with the mother uh, company here, Lehman Brothers in the United States, you can create a corporate structure uh, with lots of different veils that protect different pools of assets such that you can um, create a lot of money for the shareholders who are protected by limited liability. So that's the story that I tell there. For debt, I use um, securitized mortgages, basically uh, one of the cases that had been publicized after the 2008 financial crisis to show how you can take a loan backed by a mortgage, uh, houses located in California and sell this all the way to a Chinese investment bank um, and what happens when, when all that um, then crashes and defaults, who has what rights against this little house in California. And for know-how, I, I show how um, uh, even the genetic code has been subject to legal coding um, because the BRCA breast cancer gene um, had been sequenced by a private company first and they obtained a patent which was struck down in large parts by the Supreme Court later on but nonetheless for many many years they made a lot of money by basically um, uh, claiming that everybody had to use their kit to test for this particular gene so even nature's own code has been coded in the law. Next please. So I want to say a little bit more here about the conception of law that stands behind that. Um, there's um, Max Weber has, of course, famously coined this phrase, and others have said the same, that the modern nation state has centralized the means of coercion. Um, but it doesn't follow from that, that access to the means of coercion has, have also been centralized. Um, in fact, the legal system, and we have different legal systems in different countries, but the legal system institutionalizes access to those means of coercion by determining who how and for what purposes might access them. Next. So this is just a simple scheme just to remind ourselves, and I'm sure most of in the audience, of course, are familiar with this, but most lay people, I think, think of law as a top-down vertical uh, dictate by the state against its citizens or others on its territory. So it's public versus private, it's top-down, like criminal law or administrative law, uh, policing, regulation, etc. There might also a bit, be a little bit of um, you know, vertical from bottom to top in, in the sense that we have civil and political rights, we have claims um, that we can make under administrative law and, and, and basically push back uh, state claim, claims against us. What I'm interested in and what I wrote about in this book is the upper left-hand corner, the use of law in private relations. We always think that these are, or we, are we are always being told that these are um, uh, free markets and, um, um, and, and they work outside the state and space and the space of control exercised by the state. But in fact, all these private relations are coded in law. They use property rights, they use, use contract, they use corporate law, they use trust. And all these are legal conventions that are backed by the force of the law. And I think this is really important to realize because ultimately also these institutions are a social resource because they are backed by the coercive means of the state um, and so we're creating private wealth by using a social resource, the law. Next. So how, how do we configure this? How does the law do this? Of course, it creates standing rules. Who might make a claim in a court? And in the early enclosure movement, for example, some of the commoners who wanted to challenge the enclosure by the landlords didn't have standing in the court of law because the court would recognize only individual claims, not collective claims. So how the legal system does that will is already outcome determinative to some extent who might have the better right in the end. Then there's a question of what kind of rights I can enforce in a court of law at all. Property rights, yes. Contracts, yes. Injury to person assets, also to uh, general wealth that 
depends on the on, on the legal system we're talking about. So again, we're setting rules. They're very often arcane rules. People are not thinking about them so much, but that's how you gain access to the means of coercion, um, that you comply with these basic rules. And then, of course, the available remedies uh, matter as well. Uh, do I have property rules where I can basically say, you may not do this and I can stop you from this, or this is mine, return it. Or I have liability rules where I get compensation and, and how do they jive with the basic claim that I'm making? How effective are they in, in recognizing and enforcing those, those claims? Next, please. So what also has changed, and this is again for lay people not uh, not so clear always, and, and also many economists think of the law as um, as really static. So you allocate property rights, everybody seems to know what a property right is, and then the market players simply allocate resources um, in accordance with these rules of the game um, in, in the marketplace. What I'm trying to emphasize is that the players themselves change the rules as they play. And that is a completely different game than when you think about soccer, where there's an umpire makes sure that the same rules are being applied. And of course, the umpire might bend, it, bend them as well a little bit, but the extent to which the players, with the help of lawyers, attorneys, can change uh, the rules um, is really important. So when you think about the evolution of property rights over the last 400 years or so, we thought of property as an use right to a tangible object. Uh, you can own it, you can use it, you can exclude others from it. Then sometimes in the 19th century, and you can trace this through case law in, in the UK or in the United States, property has been transformed into expectations. Um, and then finally, I think nowadays with financial assets, property rights are configured already as just the probability um, of realizing certain expectations. And the line below, you can see the use rights is land. It's my land, and then I can I can allow others to use it, but I can also exclude them. That's what the enclosure movement was all about. Um, when we go to expectations, it's basically I, I create a business and I have a going concern, I have expectations that I can run this business and if the state then comes and closes it down or imposes regulation or builds a railway so I'm ex um, um, I cannot use my business, then I have a going concern value for which I might, depending on the rules, the specific rules, but for which I might get expropriation type of uh, damages. And then finally, um, financial assets, of course, are the quintessential example for uh, a probability. It's just a probability of reeling some expectation in the future, but if you deny me this prob probability, I might even get uh, get damages now, and I can claim that dam those damages from either private parties or the state. Next. So um, all, what all this basically tells you is that Bernard Rudden, the late legal historian, also a Soviet law person uh, who taught at Oxford for many years and died in 2015, he wrote in an article that caught my attention in 1994 already, saying the following, the traditional concepts of the common law of property were created for and by the ruling classes at a time when the bulk of their capital was land. Nowadays, the great wealth lies in stocks, shares, bonds, and the like, and it's not just movable, but mobile, crossing oceans at the touch of a keypad and the search for a fiscal utopia. And now it comes. In terms of legal theory and technique, however, there has been a profound, if little discussed, evolution by which the concepts originally devised for real property have been detached from their original object, only to survive and flourish as a means of handling abstract value. The feudal calculus lives and breeds, but its habitat is wealth not land. Next, please. Okay, so what I'm basically saying, and I'm also looking at the time, and I don't want to take too much time, so we also have time for discussion, but I have a few more minutes. Um, the, the basic message here is law is malleable, and uh, you can module it in different ways. Um, the pr institutions of private law in particular are in the hands of private players. You can create new types of claims until they are challenged. So somebody has to challenge them. Sometimes regulators do if it's if, if somebody conflicts with regulated laws, but not everything is regulated. If it's not a regulator state agent, then there has to be another private party that takes up the resources and the time, etc., to make these challenge. There's always time until you're challenged where you can make profits. And you might also get away with it, right? So if you are have you can take a, um, advantage of a first move. Um, and by, by trying to aggressively code new strategies, new assets, in the expectations that they might be recognized by a court of law if challenged. You can't ever say it's 100% um, sure, but, but you can say you're pretty, you're pretty um, safe with this. So um, the law changes not only by formal change, legislative change, or by new precedents in court, but it changes constantly by new interpretations, 
using analogies, gap filling, that's what courts do, but also by creating transactions, by writing new types of contracts, and by creating practices that even be, just because they have become practices in commerce or in investment, etc., will be recognized for that very reason by the courts later on. Next. Um, one important mechanism I just want to highlight as well before I come to the final um, major points of the book is that um, we have expanded quite a bit uh, private access to the means of coercion of not one state only but of pretty much any state by um, redefining what we call conflict of law rules or in on the continent in Europe we call it international private law. So choice of law rules uh, where I can um, pick and choose from different legal systems the rules that best suit my own purposes or the purposes of my client. That means basically that I can configure assets let's say under English law if New York doesn't accept them and we've had this in the run-up to the financial crisis right many lawyers would fly to London and do the transaction there because they couldn't do this in New York but you could do this in London and once they have been recognized in London, they might trade also on the continent. They might even trade um, uh, um, in, in the United States, subject, of course, to some regulatory compliance um, rules. You can also choose the forum. You can say we want to have disputes uh, resolved in English courts or, or New York courts or elsewhere. Um, there has been a strong trend towards English rules or New York rules and English courts and New York um, courts. You can see this in the ISTA master agreements and other, in other documents that this is a, a preference certainly in the world of finance but also trade and commerce more generally. Um, we also have pushed for more for private dispute resolu resolution, private arbitration, which is still backed by the coercive powers of the state because as long as you um, comply with basic rules of arbitration, um, states will have to enforce them, at least if they're a party to the New York Convention from 1958. So you still get universal execution of your contracts when you choose foreign law or private dispute resolution. You can still essentially hire or lease the coercive means of coercion of the state, whose, um, the courts of which will have to enforce um, the claim. Next. So who does all that? Who's done it? I just put up the cover page for the English uh, language, uh, the Italian language uh, version of my book because they put up the lawyers here. Um, uh, I call them the masters of the code. Um, so they're not the masters of capital, but they're masters of the coding of capital. And in England, I think people know this from you know, the conveyance practices of attorneys under very complicated um, realty, a lot of realty rules up till the, until the end of the 19th century. The lawyers were the only ones who really could, could figure out how to transfer an asset to somebody else or who actually owned it and had what rights to it. The same kind of techniques have been applied to different types of assets, to financial assets, of course, to intellectual property rights. So what they need to have is knowledge of the law, mastery, mastery of the malleability of law, where are the lines that you have to observe, um, etc. The ability to translate economic interests into legal categories, but also the ability to repurpose legal categories for economic interest. They must be creative, they must be persuasive, and they must have relatively elastic ethics, I would say, because they're always working at the boundary of what might be still permissible and what, what might not be, especially more in some areas like tax or financial, reg uh, um, financial issues um, than in others, but still. Um, next. So we are, know of the global financial centers, New York and London are still topping the list, others are coming up, um, but mostly people think about the global financial centers as, as the banking industry or investment industry. But these are also the hubs for global coding of capital. This is where the biggest global law firms are and this is where capital is being coded and without the lawyers, they couldn't do it. Next. So this is just a slide to show you um, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, global law firms defined simply as uh, having an office in more than one jurisdiction in the world. This is by, by profits per, per equ equity partner. Um, there are different ways in, in, in which you might measure this, but um, unless you take um, just the number of lawyers um, employed, you have in the top 50 to 100 almost exclusively Anglo-Saxon firms, American firms and English firms. Uh, some of the big Chinese firms have more headcount now, but, um, uh, but global law firms are very much dominated by Anglo-Saxon firms. And so globalization in a sense is the globalization of Anglo-Saxon legal practice. Next. 
there's legal foundations you can find in uh, in the rules of the legal profession. I will just jump over this. Let's just go to the next slide. It would take too long to go through this. Um, let me just uh, leave you with a couple of concluding um, uh, thoughts. Um, first of all, it, it takes a legal system, ideally more than one, to code capital because arbitraging is one of the fundamental techniques of coding capital. If it doesn't work under this legal system, you take another one. In England, this was first done by the law of equity. You could get around the common law with that. In the US, it was done mostly by picking the laws of a different state. And that's what we also do globally through conflict of law rules. So it takes a legal system or two to co capital and it has to be law because you want to assure yourself that whatever you created is enforceable. If in doubt, it can be enforced. You don't have to do this all the time to make this, um, to make this an important backstop. Um, legal adaptation and change at the same time is a prerequisite for a dynamic economy, a market economy based on private initiative. So there's no way to close these gaps, and I'm not arguing for closing these gaps. Um, what I'm arguing for is a recognition that um, all this is actually done on the on the backs of basically societies that sponsor legal systems. Um, uh, and then that, of course, raises the question, what is the relationship between coding capital and things like democracy, self-determination? Uh, democracies govern themselves through law and giving capital primacy um, uh, risk eroding democratic, democratic self-governance through, through, through law. And I think that's a point that we have reached. And so we have to reconsider how much leeway we give private parties to code their capital, um, even at the expense of our ability to self-govern. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Katharina. Um, you'll see there's a, a reference here to where you can uh, get hold of the book, uh, The Code of Capital, if you um, are uh, encouraged and uh, inspired to look further into um, Katharina's thinking. Um, we do have time now for, for questions, um, and we've got a fair number already uh, posted. Um, and first of all, I just want to ask a question on behalf of um, Alba Savaboda. Um, asking whether you see a relationship between your thinking about law and economics and the progressive thinking of Robert Hale, you know, the coercion in laissez-faire economic activity backed up by law. So um, you know, where, does, where does law and economics um, hit um, laissez-faire activity, I guess? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, of course, I built um, implicitly and quite explicitly on both the old institutionalists like John Commons or the realists um, in, in uh, in the American uh, tradition, so you know, I, uh, so I, I I start thinking from more the structures of the legal system and the allocation of uh, access rights to the means of coercion, and um, uh, so there, you know, I I I do think that through this institutional list lens, you can understand who has access to these uh, to these powers, and. When we talk about laissez-faire, we're basically saying we give you unconditional access to these means of coercion. You can use them in whatever way you want. Some of the realists and the American tradition have then called this well said, have said, you know, all law is public. But you could also then say all law is private. Um, but we have configured it that all, you know, private interests will have access to the means of coercion that are collectively uh, governed. So it's a, I would say it's a variation on the theme. It's not something completely new and different, but it's a variation on the theme. Thank you. Um, William Demoney is asking, um, do you have any sense of how the Chinese feel about you or being subject to American or Anglo-Saxon law? There isn't a global legal system. Um, and just comments that that would be particularly important um, as the route from Afghanistan um, starts gifting the Indian Ocean to the Chinese. Uh, East African mineral, mineral assets are being um, you know, picked up by the Chinese. You know, do you have any sense of how that is developing? So um, uh, I, I should I should say that uh, years and years ago I did a master of laws in London and I took Chinese law at so uh, so I was, and I've been following the evolution in this country um, a little bit along the way uh, although I'm not an expert on Chinese law but my understanding is that um, there is a fair amount of uh, pick and choosing different legal regimes also in China. One, of course, one obvious case is Hong Kong. So Hong Kong has been the bridge between mainland China and the global economy and um, concepts that are very much common law, like you know, fiduciary duties or trust law have been um, um, basically learned through the lens of Hong Kong in mainland China. Um, but China at the same time is not quite as open uh, in allowing people to pick and choose the law as other jurisdictions are. So Russia has basically opened its doors. This is why you have all these 
Russian cases in, in English courts. Uh, China is not quite as liberal in that, in, in, in that sense, and certain things cannot be uh, done and, uh, other than under, under Chinese law. So this is basically how countries still can retain some kind of control over the extent to which people pick and choose different legal systems to do what they want. Um, but on the other hand, many of the Chinese, um, uh, uh, first of all, many of the Chinese lawyers have been trained in American law schools, also English law schools, so they know how it's, how it's done. They can also transpose some of the ideas back into Chinese law, even if they don't pick English law. Um, uh, but there are also a fair number of Chinese companies that, that operate globally and do exactly what I'm, what I'm showing you here. Thank you. Um, Rainy Roche has read your book um, and asked in relation to your chapter focusing on cryptocurrencies and digital assets, uh, you noted that cryptocurrencies fail to meet sort of three out of the four necessary functions of money as legal or value protecting entities have not demonstrated their willingness to protect the value of cryptocurrencies. And just asking whether you know, the, the, you know, El Salvador and Cuba starting to recognize Bitcoin as legally acceptable tender, does that um, shift that? Or does it point more to a primacy of you know, other ways of looking at value? So I think it confirms what I'm saying. Um, if you want to have a stable coin, or if you want to have a real currency, and this really works that a currency is acceptable by everybody and it retains its nominal value, you've got to have a state behind it. This is why in the cryptocurrency world, they use stable coins, they use cash, or they pretend to use cash. They don't always do this, but we know this, of course, also from, from other practices in finance. But in the end, the only thing that will retain its nominal value in the times of crisis is the stuff that is issued by a state, not every state. So if the state um, doesn't have its own currency, it can't do this. If the state issue, issues its own debt under foreign currencies, it has a budget constraint. It's more like a corporation. But in principle, that's what it is. And why does can the state do this? Because it can unilateral commit our collective productivity in the future to back that thing. And no private party can do this. If a private party claims to be able to do this, it is almost a sovereign state, which is why I made the arguments against Libra. When Libra was announced by Facebook, I said, you know, that is a grab, first of all, piggybacking on the states again, but it could also, at some point, you can imagine that a company with three, you know, 2.5 billion users worldwide might basically uh, abandon uh, the link to sovereign currencies and create its own at some point in the future. But then it's becomes a sovereign in its own right. I think that there's been quite a lot of um, science fiction written around corporations in effect taking over the role of the state, um, but we'll we'll watch that one uh, as as it develops. Um, someone's asked, so it's uh, Carla Hill is asking about um, rights, like for example, freedom of expression. Um, do you see these rights as part of the way that law works with capital, um, or is this a, is this you know, something which is working against each other? Uh, you mentioned that you know, the code of the codification of capital um, might actually impinge upon um, you know, civil rights and civil society. Yeah, it's, an, it's a very interesting question. It's also a complicated one. So I, I do quote in my final chapter Chris, Christoph Menke, a German philosopher, a lot. I think his book has been now um, translated into English as well. It's called uh, The Critique of Rights. And he has a very sweeping argument is that these subjective rights, and this is not only like individual rights in the political and civil rights sense, but subjective rights in terms of my property rights, my contract claim, etc., um, which came out of the Enlightenment, I think you can trace it back to Roman law as well, um, uh, create the preconditions for the system that we have, where some just claim better rights over others. Um, uh, uh, and and there are certain interesting conflicts, right? Because through our constitutional orders, we tried to create certain fundamental rights that include the right to association, the right to freedom of speech. We're thinking more in the you know, French revolutionary and sort of the enlightenment mode um, as, um, of these rights. But many of these rights also have been repurposed for private corporate uh, business commerce purposes. And the most obvious examples you can find in the United States, right? If you get freedom of speech, for companies so that they can make financial donations to parties or candidates, or if you protect um, uh, um, the right of a company not to uh, finance, I don't know, um, uh, 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 not an abortion for sure, but 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 even uh, contraceptions because of religious beliefs of a corporation, then you can see how far this can be pushed. That's a matter of coding. So it's the lawyers who are trying to then transpose things that have been created for individuals as weapons against the state. And I think at the time when this was configured, nobody thought about the extent to which this might be abused by private parties. Um, uh, but, but, but those powerful private parties know how to use these rights for their own purposes as well. 
Okay. Um, Sean Turnbull's asked whether, well, he's, he's got a suggestion for your next book. Um, just wondering whether you need to write a complementary book on the code of codification of liabilities, um, you know, which are now embedded in you know, owning assets like property where private owners are required to insure against being sued uh, by people suffering damage or the owners of social media um, who might be sued for the content that others post on their platforms. So is there a, a complementary codification of liabilities that you see um, sitting alongside the codification of capital? So I think one of the side effects of the of the book of the coding of capital is that you're trying to um, uh, insulate interest against liability, right? This is what limited liability does in the corporation. Um, that's what insurance does as well. You're trying to diversify. You pay your fee, but you don't have to do this. And for finance, in the last instance, it's basically creating a put option for central banks that they can't possibly refuse uh, because otherwise the financial system would blow up. So there has been, I think, a, a tendency to to um, limit liability of private asset holders and to socialize that uh, liability in one way. Or, or the other, um, so I don't see I don't see a death of liability as Lapuki called it a couple of years ago. But I do see a and sort of a shift of liability, which is part of the game. If you want to be wealthy, you don't want to be held liable. And I think the pushbacks that you mentioned, some requirements to ensure against that, is just a partial remedies for the general shift of liability to others. Thank you. Um, questions are coming thick and fast, so we'll <laughs> carry on. Uh, Stephen Mix um, comments that taking the concept of legal system as in the modern nation state as a means of institu institutionalizing coercion and power, it implies an attempt to democratize power in some way. Uh, and this seems to him an honor honorable principle and move away from the historically traditional means of coercion based on class systems and birth given power. He first of all asked, do you agree with that? <laughs> But second, do you think that um, you know, nation states that don't rely on legal systems to the same level as modern states would benefit from following that example to help democ democratize power? Um, and do you see any challenges to this development? So quite a big question. Yeah, so so I, I will agree with the first question. I think that was the idea that we would democratize power, right, by creating constitutions. Under what, cons what, under what conditions you can go back to the Magna Carta? Under what conditions can the ruler first sort of, you know, exercise certain powers? Um, what rights do um, the constituencies have? And then over time, you're trying to define this uh, more closely and you're trying to create conditions under which power can be used. The one thing that has, you know, one aspect of this um, whole story that has been uh, not worked out so closely in the constitutional setup is the use of coercion by private parties, right? So that we sort of so much thinking in terms of negative rights, really. And then maybe we have a debate about positive rights, but we're not talking really about access to the means of coercion by private power. And I think fairly quickly after the French Revolution already, um, Thomas Piketty writes about this, especially in his second book, within decades after the French Revolution, uh, the levels of inequality had reached the same level like pre uh, pre-revolution in France again. And that's private coding, right? I mean, everything about the French Revolution for those who had gained power then was to redefine the property rights that could be safeguarded um, in the hands of the new owners. And, and of course, it creates the same thing. So, so I think we have to recognize that, yes, there was a great idea to democratize the means of coercion. Has it um, fulfilled these promises? Partly yes, but not fully. And there's a danger that it can be captured by powerful private interests and used for their means such that it erodes democracy. Keeping that in mind and knowing that already, I think we have to caution uh, countries just to blindly follow down this path, but think about very hard about how to um, uh, manage that that dynamic a little better. Because I think it's it's just a, a dynamic that is built into a competitive capitalist system that's just unavoidable. Thank you. We've got a couple of linked questions here. Um, one from Christian Stoichev and another from Thomas Barker. Uh, Christian talks about um, how do you think about decentralized finance where smart contracts can code individual rules and execute effectively without a court judgment? You trust the coding to get to get it right. Um, and Thomas Barker asks whether your objections to cryptocurrencies extend to more traditional property rights that, that can be mediated by smart contracts, um, whether that's bills of lading, property titles, whatever it is. Um, so is, is smart coding one of the answers, I guess, is, is the question. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I talk about this in, 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 in the book a little bit. I have a chapter which is called the, a new code question mark. So the question is, would the digital code replace the legal code? And in, in the book, I which I finished three years ago, really, um, I, I came down saying, I think uh, the legacy code will encode the crypto code, <laughs> the digital code. So far, I'm, 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 not, I'm not that sure anymore, but I think we have to be realistic about what uh, smart contracts can do and what they cannot do. Is the fact that uh, uh, the world is uncertain, future is uncertain, and that contracts are in complete are, I think, fundamental principles that the smart contracts won't get around with. So this is why smart concept contracts are already built in an oracle or some ways in which we can correct something that we couldn't possibly have anticipated um, when we when we originally wrote them. So in many sense, I think the digital um, uh, technologies sort of confront us with the same fundamental problems that we've seen in the legal coding. You can't write complete contracts. You can't do this in digits either. You might, with AI in the future, have self-correcting contracts. And then the question is whether humans are willing to subject themselves to an automatic system that will adapt um, in, in, in those particular ways or whether they will call it off, right? And I, I discussed the DAO in the book and say, well, you know, they went offline and then these are the sovereigns, right? It, you know, calling the state of emergency, as Carl Schmidt, whom I don't quote very often said, but calling the state of emergency is where the power is. These are the coders. And so these are our new little governments who are doing the, the smart, smart coding. It's a field that is developing rapidly. I don't have, you know, special coding expertise myself on the techno technology front and uh, so I I'm watching that space but I think we should also not be too um, too rosy-eyed about it. And, uh, another couple of linked questions, um, John Taylor and Andrew Purvis. John asks why you think the coding of capital can erode our ability to self-govern um, and you know why is our ability to self-govern so important uh, and Andrew Purvis asks if if there was a threat to democracy from the coercion exercised by legal instruments, how should we fight back? Yeah. So so um, first of all, how, how does it work? I mean, it's I think it's, it's it's relatively simple. If we are a democracy and we say we govern ourselves by law, so we make laws in certain ways, and we can say we do this through courts and we have case law, and we do this through the legislature. If powerful people can then say, well, we will opt out of the law and we'll take some different laws, but we're still here and we still use your laws to enforce this, but it's just a different legal regime, then we're having problem with self-governance. So simply put, if all of us chose our own laws that we like best, you can't have a functioning legal system, right? So the question is how, how far do we push it? I'm not saying eliminate, eliminate any kind of choice of law for some contractor, it's fine. But even for you know corporations, et cetera, I think one, one could question the extent to which we have recognized uh, legal shells built in all kinds of jurisdictions and then allowed this for tax evasion purposes, regulatory arbitrage purposes, et cetera. That it, erodes the ability of communities to say these are the rules of the games that we want to protect on this territory at least in this kind of community is there something to be said for communal type of or collective kind of type of governance i think you know if you believe in democracy then there is it's the idea is that maybe the people should be the sovereign rather than some self-anointed um families and their descendants or um you know some warriors or some i don't know digital um uh, you know the digital dictators that might be emerging right now, whatever you want to call them. So I still think there should be some accountability. Uh, I don't think our democ democratic system works anymore. I think we have to rethink how, how it, it might work better, but I do believe in um, in sort of the collective control of the means of coercion. I would not, never leave them in the hands of a few without some accountability me mechanisms. Um, I'm not sure this answers everything, but but that in short, I think is is uh, what this is all about. Now, what could we do against this? Um, if you know, so so I think if I say opting out to a large extent or excessively opting out and picking and choosing, then I think the response to that has to be limit that ability limit um, the access to different legal orders that are still enforceable, allow courts, if they have to enforce it, to look over whether this is really compliant with domestic norms, not only with the public um, public policies or the auto public as we as we currently do under the New York Convention. So there, there are mechanisms I think that we could use and, and uh, force a little bit just by throwing sands into the mills. I think we would also slow the system down a little bit. We've got two very final questions. We're almost out of time, but uh, it's been fascinating. Um, first of all, um, Ian Neal asks what your view is on the uh, pernicious effects, as he calls it, upon developing countries of investor state dispute resolution rules that's built into many bilateral multilateral trade agreements. Um, do you have thoughts on that? Yes, I'd, I'd say a little bit about this, the book as well. What I would say is in, with the investor state dispute resolution mechanism, we have created a new type of property rights at the international level. 
we have elevated whatever investment is and whatever the tribunals say it is to something that can get property-like damages and never have created that in a transnational. So we have corporations that have no obligations on international law but can use international law to hold sovereign states accountable outside their territory and enforce anywhere they go. So, so um, uh, is this compatible with democracy? No. Under the Vienna Convention, they don't even have to respect the constitutional constraints of the host states where these um, uh, investments have taken place. It functions in parts, at least, as an insurance system for foreign investors, and uh, and I find this deeply problematic. Thank you. And a final question. Uh, Shan Turbel asks, as the International Accounting Standards Board doesn't have a definition for economic value, um, how would you say the law defines value? Well, I think the law is never very, very precise about what exactly, um, how it exactly it defines the value. I would also say accounting rules and tax rules and legal rules are, you know, the, the, the three sets of rules um, uh, um, that all account for the coding of capital. But I think uh, there is no clear definition that I know of uh, in the law. It always refers also to accounting to some other practices. It evades actually being very clear about this. Well, we, we really are out of time. Uh, it's been a very lively uh, question session, uh, but thank you very much for that. Um, so I'll bring this bring things to a close. First of all, again, to thank our sponsors. It's been a fascinating um, discussion this afternoon. Uh, we will be posting a recording of this on the uh, website afterwards. Um, so if you want to go and revisit any of that, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, but thanks again to our sponsors for allowing us to, to, to range far and wide. Um, we've got um, more events coming up, of course. Um, next week, uh, share schemes for non-employees and the gig economy, uh, deforestation linked sovereign bonds, uh, which is a fascinating subject when we think about diversity, biodiversity and how we can uh, link uh, value to that. Um, all par party parliamentary groups, what purpose they serve, and deception and truth analysis for investors. So uh, a wide range of uh, interesting topics to come. Uh, do sign up, um, the link to the website is there. So it just remains uh, for me to uh, do a round of thanks really. Well, first of all, um, to you for attending and for your interest and your questions. Uh, it's been a fascinating session, which um, I've really enjoyed and I hope uh, Katharina has also uh, in enjoyed the occasion. Um, but, but really to say a huge thank you to Katharina for her time, uh, her intelligent analysis and her engagement with um, a you know, very, very set of questions. Um, we would recommend the book, obviously. Uh, so, so if you want to get further into this, um, you know, do go and investigate Katharina's book, um, which uh, it goes into more detail on all of this. But Katharina, thank you very much. Normally I'd throw open the floor for a round of applause, um, which is a bit difficult on a webinar. So you'll have to do with, with a very small round of applause. Um, but many thanks indeed for your time and your engagement today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, thank you everybody and we'll see you at a future event. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>